Welcome everyone. It's nice to see a full room of people here to celebrate Carmen Benito's new publication here at the Library of Congress. My name is Talia Guzman Gonzalez and I'm a reference librarian in the Hispanic Division here in the library and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to this presentation of Spain and the Atlantic coast of the United States, four characters from the 16th century in search of an author. On behalf of the Hispanic Division, our chief, Dr. Susan Shadel, and everyone in the division, I would like to welcome you. I'm going to give the stage, the podium, to Dr. Ada Meredis, who's the head of the Spanish and Portuguese department at the University of Maryland, who's going to introduce the speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I have to thank very warmly Talia Guzman Gonzalez because thanks to her, we've been able to um, set up this kind of partnership with the, the Library of Congress uh, for I think the third year in a row of presenting um, the, the wonderful work of our colleagues in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. So I'd like to thank Georgette Dorn, who's basically the outgoing uh, chief of the Hispanic Division, and I'd like to welcome also Suzanne uh, Shadel, who's going to be our new uh, chief. And uh, I cannot say enough good things about the, the Library of Congress and the, the Hispanic Division. Um, you guys make this uh, kind of events really uh, worth it for us to come out here. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, it's a tr welcome to um, all of you. Thank you for being here. And uh, it, it kind of helped that it's kind of humid out there. <laughs> and we can take refuge over here. <laughs> 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 but you see that this will be uh, worth it, every minute of it, because we have uh, the presentation of this wonderful book written by my uh, colleague, Carmen Benito Vesel, Spain on the Atlantic Coast of the US. Four characters uh, from the 16th century in search of an author. If we had any doubts that Spanish should be spoken in Virginia, Washington, D.C., Maryland, all along the coast from the Carolinas of, uh, this book has proven basically that it's probably the first European language that was uh, uh, spoken in the eastern coast of the U.S. Um, uh, we have two wonderful guests, and I'm going to introduce, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce everyone. Um, here and uh, and then they each will take turns uh, talking and uh, we're going to open the the conversation at the end so we can ask general questions and and we can you know establish a dialogue. So um, Carmen Benito Vessels received her BA in Roman uh, Philology from the University of Salamanca in 1977, pursued postgraduate studies at the University of Lisbon and English Philology at the University of Salamanca, and earned her PhD at the University of California Santa Barbara in. 1988, I don't want to date you, Carmen, but <laughs> <laughs> Benito Vessels has worked at the University of Maryland since 1988, where she has uh, headed the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and also been the Director of Graduate Studies. She's currently full professor in Spanish uh, philology, philology, medieval, and early modern studies. Her cutting edge uh, research skillfully combines classical and contemporary studies, while insightful and original combinations of the diverse interests have captivated a wide academic transatlantic um, audience. Benito Vessels has published in numerous articles and chapters in collective monographs. In fact, the journal Medievalia from the UNAM in Mexico has just chosen one of her artic articles from 20 years ago about the Gran Conquista de Ultramar to be reprinted next year in a special edition celebrating 30 years of the journal. And um, she's also the author of four books. The first one is Juan Manuel, Escritura y Recreación de la Historia, University of Wisconsin uh, Press, from 1994. La Palabra en el Tiempo de las Letras, Una Historia Heterodoxa, from the Fondo de Cultura Económico, 2007. Lenguaje y Valor en la Literatura Medieval Española, from Juan de la Cuesta, Monographs from 2013. And the one that we are presenting today, if you haven't had a chance to look at the book, is up there. Take a look at it. It's been published by the uh, Angle and just came out of the press. It's hot from the press. She's also the co-editor co of two volumes, The Picaresque, a symposium on the, on the Rogue Tale um, from 1994, and Women at Work in uh, Spain from the Middle Ages uh, to Early Modern um, Times. She's lectured widely and uh, participated in international seminars uh, in the United States, France, Portugal, Spain, Germany, Argentina, Ecuador, Mexico. 
Benito Vessels is also a miembro numerario of the North American Academy of the Spanish Language. We're celebrating her today, and uh, don't forget to congratulate her. This is a wonderful occasion for us at the University of Maryland. This is the kind of talent that we have on our faculty, and we're very proud of it. I'm also very pleased to have, uh, to welcome two uh, guests that we have invited for today, uh, Raquel, Professor Raquel Chan Rodriguez and Professor Alison Bigelow, who will be presenting uh, the book for us. And let me just give a brief, a brief introduction about each one of them. Raquel Chan Rodriguez, la ilustre, <laughs> but also <laughs> cercana, it's a dear friend, wonderful colonialist. Her PhD is from New York University, and she's a distinguished professor of Spanish and American literature and cultures at the Graduate Center at the City College, CUNY, where she co-directs the Catedra Mario Vargas Llosa. Her most recent publications is a translation edition of the Franciscan Luis Jerónimo de Ore, account of the martyrs of the provinces of La Florida, that uh, just came out in U University of, of New Mexico Press. Other titles by Chan Rodriguez are Cartografía Garcilasista from uh, 2013, Aquí Ninfas del Sur, Venid Ligeras, Voces Poéticas Virreinales from 2008, Beyond Books and Borders, Garcilaso de la Vega and La Florida del Inca, 2006, and if you haven't seen an uh, um, uh, original you know, um, uh, edition of La Florida del Inca, it's right here, you can actually uh, peruse so these wonderful books. And she's published that simultaneously in English and Spanish. She is the founding editor of the prize-winning journal Colonial Latin American Review, for we all are very thankful. And the recipient of several grants and awards, including the National Endowment of the Humanities <coughs> Fellowship and the Enrique Anderson Inver Pri Anderson In Inver Prize, given by the Academia Norteamericana de Lengua Española, ANLE. The National Hellenic University, Athens, Greece, awarded Chan Rodriguez a Dr. Noris Causa, she is Professor Honoraria of the Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos, in Lima, Peru, uh, Miembro Correspondiente of the Academia Peruana de la Lengua and the Academia Norteamericana de la Lengua, affiliates of the Royal Academy of the Spanish Language. Welcome, Raquel. Thank you for being here. I'm also going to introduce Alison Bigelow, who is an Assistant Professor of Colonial Latin America in the Department of Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese at the University of Virginia. Her research on indigenous literacies, gender systems, and colonial science, especially vernacular sciences like mining and agriculture, has been published or is forthcoming from journals like Anuario de Estudios Bolivianos, Early American Studies, Early American Literature, Ethnohistory, the Journal of Extractive Industries and Society, and the PMLA. With fellowships from the Huntington Library and American Council of Learned Societies, in 2017, uh, 2018, she completed her book, Manuscript, Cultural Touch Tones, Mining, Refining, and the Language of Empire in the Early Americas, which is due in the editor's inbox at the Omohundro Institute <laughs> of <laughs> Early American History and Culture by December 12th. So cross your fingers for her. <laughs> she is a star coming. And so. so Thank you again for being here. I'm just gonna basically call Raquel to the podium and we're gonna start um, this wonderful academic intellectual journey. Library of Congress, uh, particularly at this event sponsored by the Hispanic Division. Uh, the library, of course, uh, holds many uh, books that are dear to us that do research in various uh, genres and uh, periods. Uh, and uh, also it holds the voice of writers, authors, some of them are gone. And I was listening by chance the other day to the voice of a dear uh, person that I know, Jose Juan Arrón, that was uh, uh, recorded here at the Library of Congress. And it was really moving and a thrill because he has been gone for a number of years. And he was a forerunner of colonial studies 
and the development of the field in the US. And I am um, here thanks to Benita. Thank you uh, for inviting me to be here. Thank you, Ada, uh, a good friend uh, with whom I have traveled in several areas, including the Galapagos Islands that we were reminiscing this afternoon. Benita has brought us uh, not only to, um, to Florida with her book, but I think also with the climate. How did you manage <laughs> that? <laughs> so, and I, I want to thank Ada for uh, the lovely introdu introduction and mentioning that I am distinguished. Sometimes I feel extinguished more, <laughs> than <laughs> but I have, it's great to be here. So I will um, then uh, read my thoughts on the book and share them with you. I have some slides that I will um, uh, try to uh, present as we go on. So, um, in, es in España y la costa atlántica de los Estados Unidos, cuatro personajes del siglo XVI en busca de autor. Spain and the Atlantic coast of the U.S. Four characters of the 16th century in search of an author. Can you hear me? I'm a little bit nervous with this microphone. I don't, I'm not off, off a whimpery like. <laughs> but so, anyhow, um, Carmen Benito Vessels aims to recover without reservations, the early history of the country of Washington and Jefferson by restoring a glaring omission, the Spanish presence in our land. The title <coughs> alludes partially to a drama by Luigi Pirandello that in turn refers to a novel by Miguel de Unamuno. As the names given to people, to books, to geographical spaces are not assigned by chance, it is important to explore briefly the connections of this title. In his drama, Six Characters in Search of an Author, released in 1921, the Sicilian Pirandello presents the rela relationship of the playwright with his scenic protagonist. In his novel, Niebla, the Spaniard Unamuno created a narrative based on events uh, from the life of its protagonist, Augusto Perez. Both works, the play and the novel, question the relationship between authors and characters. They offer also a philosophical meditation on existent identity, the link between reality and imagination. At the same time, the books inform readers as to how a dramatic piece or a work of fiction should be written. Like Pirandello and Unamuno, Benito Vessels carefully selects her protagonists and situates them in a different paradigm the paradigm is the reconfiguration of North American history of the Atlantic Southeast. Through the analysis of the deeds of two native protagonists, Francisco de Chicora and Don Luis de Velasco, also known as Paquiquino or Paquiquineo, and two Spaniards, Lucas Vázquez de Ayón and Pedro Menéndez de Avilés, the author guides us through a time when the Spanish presence in territories now part of the United States was paramount. By charting the itinerary of these characters, Benito Vessels attempts to explain why they, and also others, are absent from the early history of the United States. It is worth remembering who these forgotten historical actors are. Francisco de Chicora, or El Chicorano, was one of 70 natives of the coast of the current state of South Carolina, deceived, imprisoned, and enslaved in 1521 by two Spanish conquistadors. When they arrived in Santo Domingo of Hispaniola, 
unauthorities there found that these natives were not rebels and therefore could not be sold as a slave, the group was released and in their turn, they were ordered to return to the mainland. However, the return trip was never made and most died in Santo Domingo. Among the survivors of the group was Francisco de Chicora, who was baptized, learned Spanish, and began to tell the wonders and riches of his native land, perhaps with the secret desire to return to it. As expected, such descriptions did not go unnoticed. The learned and powerful judge, Lucas Vasquez de Ayllón, soon became protector of El Chicorano and took him to Spain to the court. There he met none other than uh, the chronicle Peter Martyr de Angleria, who penned the descriptions of the land Francisco de Chicora uh, was telling about and thus began to build the <coughs> legend that resul resulted in the expedition to the chimerical Nueva Andalusia. Charles V granted lawyer Vasquez de Ayllón the right to explore and colonize the lands of Chicora, and there he went with six ships and more than 600 persons. And of course, the guide was Francisco El Chicorano. After arriving, Francisco disappeared and he was never seen. The expedition was a total failure. Uh, Vasquez de Ayllón died uh, in North American lands. There was a settlement of uh, a very brief duration. The colony was called San Miguel de Gualdape, and it's now located in South Carolina. The, the San Miguel de Gualdape precedes San Agustin de la Florida, the English colonies of Roanoke and Jamestown for several decades. In a map uh, by Diego Rivero, the area explored by the unfortunate Oidor is called Tierra de Ayllón, and this is the map that Carmen has used for the cover of the book. Let's go to the second character, Luis de Velasco or Paquiquineo, uh, which is another protagonist discussed by Benito Vesil. He was an Indian from the modern state of Virginia, Allison, uh, probably of Algonquin ethnicity, who by force or by his own free will, we don't know, joined a Spanish expeditionary force. Educated by Dominicans and Jesuits, protected by the Viceroy of New Spain, and by baptized with his name, the young man traveled to Spain, Mexico, and Havana with friars who insisted on creating a mission in the Bay of Santa Maria de Ajacán, right here, Chesapeake Bay. Don Luis managed to return to his land, accompanied by Jesuit priests and brothers. He served as a guide for them, and then later on, he murdered the priest and brothers. Pedro Menéndez de Avilés, uh, then governor of Cuba and adelantado of La Florida, was in charge of punishing Don Luis and his followers for their misdeeds, but they were never found. It is worth mentioning or noting that Menéndez de Avilés, supported by relatives from Asturias and friends uh, from that same area, had far more ambitions for La Florida. Number one, he was determined to expel the French, which he did. Number two, he wanted to find a land route from Zacatecas in Nueva España 
in order to cross the continent and uh, with the silver from that mining town and avoid the pirates, uh, French and English, that were roaming the Caribbean. Number three, and this was still interesting to us, he aimed to explore the north of Florida. I'm not talking about Florida Peninsula. Florida was a vast land extending up to what is today Kansas. And he hoped remotely to find a way to China. Uh, <laughs> number four, uh, to continue evangelizing the native of La Florida with Franciscan missionaries and obviously to colonize the area and establish settlements as point of entry to the center of North America. He, life happens, died of typhus uh, before any of these plans could be realized. Uh, in an account backed by careful research, the characters Benito Vessels of, of Benito Vessels acquire a life of their own in a historical flow where the predominant role of Spain has been historically minimized. First, she explains, this was due to the territorial ambitions of England and France, and later in the independence period and in the 19th century, to those who put together a history tinted with religious preferences, ethnic prejudice, outright carelessness, or simple ignorance of the sources that amply support the role and the presence of Spain. Not many listened to Thomas Jefferson, and I brought his image to us, uh, because he donated his books to this very library, you know? Not very ma many listened to Jefferson. He was a reader of Cervantes, and not only Don Quixote, uh, but other novels and uh, tracts by Cervantes. And he frank Jefferson frequently indicated that in order to know the early history of the United States, and to establish a strong relations with our neighbors to the south, it is essential to learn Spanish. Carefully chosen and studied with determination by Benito Vessels, her characters, the Chicorano, Don Luis, Vasquez de Ayón, Menendez de Aviles, can be added to other early authors and protagonists. Alvar Núñez Cabeza de Vaca, Hernando de Soto, Inca Garcilaso, Alonso Gregorio de Escobedo, Luis Jerónimo de Oré, that, in the words of Benito Vessel, constitute the missing link to Spain in the early modern history of the United States. Their career, as the author has pointed out, and I quote her now, is full <coughs> of a small triumph great failures and enormous risks, end of quote. Without exception, <coughs> Benito Vessel's book illuminates these complex periods and helps us appreciate the many facets of an early Hispanic presence in territories which later will become part of the United States. The research summarized in the book by Carmen also leads to other facets of the early colonial period of North America, particularly to translation and cartography. It is worth remember how Spanish sources related to the area were put to use, and also the preference on the part of the English to disseminate works where a given chronically harshly criticized a Spanish colonization. One work comes to mind, Fray Bartolomé de las Casas, Brevísima Re Historia de la Destrucción de las in Indias, translated with a very graphic title of Tears of the Indians. As for misrepresentations, 
perhaps the most notable case is the translation by Congressman Robert Greenhouse of the chronological essay for the o general history of Florida by Andres Gonzalez Barcia. Following Anne Brickhouse, the author explains how Greenhouse disassociates the history of Virginia from the Spanish presence in that territory, thus diminishing its link to the indigenous past through the demonization of Don Luis. In this sense, Benito Vessel's books brings to the fore the debate about what gives the right to possession, discovery or colonization. Obviously, England fell uh, that colonization was the answer to that, but we can dis talk about this later. Central to the polemic illustrated by the biography of the four initial characters is the language of cartography. Maps, explains Carmen, do not just point to a route by means of the images illustrating their edges, the selection of drawing, of a style of arrangement, of colors and line, they offer a language that first we must know how to decipher, how to understand. As we know, the Spanish navigational charts were jealously guarded in the Casa de Contratación in Seville. Sailors sponsored by Spain had the obligation to indicate new discoveries and routes in the Royal Register and could not discuss them under penalty of death. However, due to the defections of cartographers and the pressures of other European powers, secrets were frequently revealed. Benito Vessels offers my classical example, and I will bring this to your attention. The German cartographer Martin Waldesmuller inscribed the name of the continent, America, in his 1507 map. Prepare thanks to the information provided to him by Americo Vespucci at that time at the service of the Spanish crown. Chapter 7, Cartographers to Power, is a true treasure trove as far as information while also showcasing the practices of the time. As the author points out, these struggles, cartographic struggles, make us think <coughs> of a Mundo O'Gorman classic book, The Invention of America. Imagine not only by chroniclers, but also by cartographers who responded to the interest of a wealthy and curious European readership, devoted themselves to describing and plotting the wonders of the new world. We cannot fail to mention common practices in the Spanish colonial expansion evident in North America and in South America. For example, in the conquest of the Inca Empire, the Pizarristas, or the followers of uh, Francisco Pizarro, sought with earnest the grave of the Inca kings. It wasn't because they were devoted. Uh, they wanted to basically, as far as the priest uh, goes, they wanted to find um, information to um, accuse the Inca kings of being idolaters. And the soldiers of Pizarro or Pizarro's cohort um, knew that the Inca kings, the Inca lords, were buried with large amounts of gold and silver and treasure. And they wanted to go uh, to where they were buried just to check on the booty. Uh, on the Atlantic coast of North America, pearls often replace the coveted metals, and these are also sought in temples and graves. In his account of the Martyrs of Florida, the Peruvian Franciscan, Luis Jerónimo Lloré, proposes to activate in La Florida 
a method of evangelization that was a disaster uh, for the Andean population in what was then the Viceroyalty or, or, or Peru. Uh, the reducciones. <coughs> it, it, didn't, it, it was never implemented in Florida. Now, in her desire to understand the kind of history that produces distortions and omissions, Carmen Benito Vessels, a medievalist by <coughs> training, goes to the prologue of Garcia Rodriguez de Montalvo in his recasting of the Amadis de Gaula, the classic chivalric novel. In his prologue uh, to this book, the author speaks of three types of history. Um, <coughs> number one was the true factual narrative about real deeds provided by a reliable eyewitness. Number two was what he calls historia de afición, hobby history of, or writing history for the love of it and offering a partial representation. And number three would be historia fingida or false history, which recasts facts <coughs> within the realm of the real maravilloso and is equivalent to fiction. As we know, the three models are evident in the stories and chronicles about the Spanish Indies and its Frontera Norte. The Frontera Norte is what is now the United States. However, clarifies Benito Vessels in the configuration of the early history of the current United States, hobby history predominates with the consequent exclusion of the Hispanic component. So in her book, Carmen outlines this forgotten history and underscores the importance of its recovery and study. I conclude remembering, going back to the beginning, words attributed to Pirandello, and I quote, we do not give life to a character by chance. The dictum helps us to understand why the author selected her protagonist, the four protagonists, Francisco de Chicora, Don Luis de Velasco, Lucas Vázquez de Ayón, and Pedro Menéndez de Aviles, and place them in the context of an exact textual journey. Like Augusto Pérez in Niebla by Unamuno, the protagonists refuse to disappear they clamor for recognition. And from the Atalaya, the watchover of your journey, Carmen, who is a wise sentinel, recovers these historical figures and gives them new life. In this way, the book that we present and celebrate today contributes to the necessary and welcome rescue of the early Spanish history of the United States in its Atlantic side. I thus congratulate Carmen for her accomplishment and thank her for plotting such a worthwhile journey. And I learned so much. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel, for this wonderful intervention, for reminding us the treasures that are here at the Library of Congress, for all of us to use, uh, for reminding us about the words of Jefferson, who insisted that we all must learn Spanish. And uh, the University of, Le of Maryland is here to help you if you haven't started <laughs> yet. <laughs> we have a pretty serious program. Come to us. <laughs> And uh, um, I would like to uh, basically call Alison Bigelow now too. And by the way, I have to apologize. I mischaracterized this, uh, this presentation today as a book presentation. It's really a mini symposium. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for the invitation to share some of my thoughts on this fascinating book and the questions that it opens up for our field with this group today. I'd like to begin by recognizing that we are on indigenous soil, the ancestral home of communities like the Piscataway, who were only recognized by the state of Maryland in 2012, and by recognizing the many intellectual and creative contributions of indigenous women and men, present and past, to the kinds of academic exchanges that we're engaging in today. 
In his capacious and meticulously researched comparison of British and Spanish imperial strategies and colonial practices, historian John Huxtable Elliott Elliot names what is perhaps the deepest and most persistent methodological challenge in the study of the early Americas, our lack of a time machine. Without such a device, it's hard to say how the paths of the two largest European empires of the Atlantic world would have forked their ways and forced their powers upon the American landscape had their circumstances unfolded differently. What would Spanish colonization have looked like in places without large mines and without indigenous communities who had developed sophisticated metallurgical technologies to process those ores? What might English colonization have looked like in a place like Potosí or Zacatecas? Eliot, entertaining a well-reasoned counterfactual in his, books, in his book, Empires of the Atlantic World, Britain and Spain in America, 1492 to 1830, published by Yale University Press in 2006, argues that if large quantities of silver had indeed been found in Virginia, there is little reason to doubt that, that the development of an extractive economy would have created a high spending elite which would have more than lived up to the dreams of the gentlemen settlers of Jamestown. But instead, the presence or absence of silver and of large native populations that could be domesticated to European purposes had other implications for the imperial enterprises. These implications were both local and global. Local because they affected the day-to-day -day realities of women and men who made their homes in Virginia before and after the forced and unforced arrivals of Africans and Europeans in the region. And global because scholars trace the origins of world trade to this historical moment in the 16th century. Because silver was worth almost twice as much as gold in East Asia, Iberian agents extracted it in the Americas, shipped it to China and Japan, and traded silver, which they liked, but not that much, for gold, which commanded the highest prices in European bimetallic markets, at a profit of nearly two to one. Then they used that gold to purchase people and goods on their return through the Indian Ocean world, West Africa, and Europe, before departing to the Americas to once more extract silver and initiate a new cycle of world trade, slavery, and capitalist political economy. So these two factors, silver mines and indigenous populations, shaped their respective crown's roles in all aspects of colonial planning. Because the English crown did not expect great profit from its foreign plantations, it maintained a relatively low profile in the crucial opening stages of development, according to Eliot. In contrast, the Spanish crown intervened heavily in colonial affairs and documented its decision-making powers in nearly every aspect of life in the Americas. Letters, books that were printed and not printed, petitions from colonial subjects, policies determined at council, and maps that were shared and guarded. <coughs> Scholars who study the Spanish empire do not suffer from a lack of primary sources, although these sources are often silent on the kinds of questions that we ask today. Hence, Eliot's question about the possible paths of colonization can really only be answered with a time machine that would allow us to place British imperial agents in what is today Latin America and to place Spanish imperial agents in what is today the United States. So fortunately for us, and with the use of textual interpretation, cartographic analysis, and historiographic study, rather than the time machine that our colleagues in physics have yet to build for us, <laughs> this is precisely what Professor Carmen Benito Vessels does in her new study, España y la Costa Atlántica de los Estados Unidos, Cuatro Personajes del Siglo XVI en Busca de Autor, published this year uh, in New York by the Academia Norteamericana de la Lengua Española. That is, Professor Benito Vessels locates in a wealth of documentary evidence and visual sources, many of which are housed here in the Library of Congress, the materials for a history of Spanish colonization in what is today Maryland, Virginia, Georgia, and the Carolinas, and what was at the time a complex constellation of Algonquin-speaking communities who traded with, with diverse indigenous peoples like copper-producing cultures of present-day Michigan and Iroquois mer merchants from present-day New York. These were not separate closed communities, but critical players in a dynamic indigenous world that negotiated change and continuity before and after colonization. Two historical actors from these communities, two uh, indigenous historical actors from these communities are at the heart of Benito Vessels' book. Francisco Chicora, or Chicorano, in Spanish language sources, a man we think to have been Catawba based on where he was captured by Licenciado Lucas Vasquez de Ayon, for whom he served as a guide and interpreter in what is now Georgia, Virginia, and the Carolinas, and Don Luis de Velasco, named after the Viceroy of New Spain, who served as guide and interpreter for Pedro Menendez de Aviles in what is now Florida and South Carolina. 
The book focuses on these two indigenous men, although there are many other native actors whose histories we could trace as message-shaping go-betweens. The decision to re reveal and conceal information, decisions made by men like Juanillo and Perico in, in North America, by women like Pocahontas in Tidewater, Virginia, Doña Maria Magdalena and Antonia in Timucuan speaking regions of La Florida, Doña Marina or La Malinche in Mexico, and the unnamed informants whom Colón took as his prisoners in La Española on November 12, 1492, believing that the women would teach him their language and that native men would not run away if Iberian forces held their families, shaped the movements of Spanish imperial agents, as well as those of the many Italian explorers and Portuguese subjects who Carmen quite, quite rightly points out worked on behalf of the Spanish crown in these early years of New World contact and conquest. As these examples suggest, La Florida was a space of contested waters and unstable ground, a shifting site of imperial rivalry between and among factions of English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese colonists who negotiated with indigenous confederations, or empires, as some might say, given that Captain John Smith calls paramount chief Wakan Seneca, known as Powhatan in English, English language sources, an emperor. And yet, as Benito Vessel shows in her book, much of this multilingual pluricultural past has been papered over, or perhaps more accurately, whitewashed, in a series of historical distortions, intentional or not, that have reinforced a narrative of what she beautifully calls la accidental occidentalización de los Estados Unidos, or the careful fashioning of the history of the United States into a narrative of white Western modernity. Professor Benito Vessels makes a convincing and well-documented case for a determined crafting of Western identity and heritage in British-speaking North America, one that marginalized its indigenous roots, African histories, and multiple European colonizations. As we learn in España y la Costa Atlántica de los Estados Unidos, the making of an Anglophone national identity was a slow process that unfolded over time as 19th and 20th century academics and government officials like William Gil Gilmore Sims, Robert Greenhough, mentioned by Raquel, and Frederick Jackson Turner funded, wrote, published, cited, and taught histories in which England and France became metageographic points of reference. Metageographic, Carmen explains, in the sense that these thinkers use cartographic logic and spatial imaginaries to project a particular vision about their country, its origins, and its place in the world. They chose to adopt France and England rather than Spain or Portugal as critical points of reference in this making of national mythology. France's alignment with England, in contradistinction to other Romance-speaking languages, recalls philosopher Immanuel Kant's two-part taxonomy of the character of the nations, articulated in his observations on the feeling of the beautiful and sublime. Writing in 1798, Kant sketched a model of world division in which France, England, and Germany stood on one side, and Spain, Italy, and Portugal on the other. These six European powers form the analogical root of his comparative framework, wherein he writes, if the Arabs are, as it were, the Spaniards of the Orient, then the Persians are the Frenchmen of Asia, and the Japanese can be regarded, as it were, as the Englishmen of this part of the world. Such 18th century assessments were not just anthropological, aesthetic, or racist. They were, for Kant, evaluations of morality. As he argued, the characters of mind of the people are most evident in that, in them, which is moral. Over time, these moral geographic assessments became indistinguishable from ideas about languages and the people who speak them. According to Walter Mignolo, in the transition from Renaissance humanism to 18th century enlightenment, English, German, and French replaced Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese as the perceived knowledge-generating grammars of reason and scientific modernity. In Mignolo's compelling history of the perception and power of language, there was a fracture within the Romance languages, and the fault line was French. Although French maintained what he calls the expressive flair attributed to Romance languages, it was also the language of philosophical rigor and one of the colonial powers of modernity. After World War II, these divisions were magnified by new geographic interpretations of political economy, in which much of the Francophone world, with the exception of Canada, he notes, began to share with Spanish its belonging to the third world. As Mignolo argues based on his reading of Martinique philosopher Franz Fagnon's Black Skin, White Masks. 
to understand how these processes developed in the 18th and 19th centuries and how they came to exert such influence over the 20th century world, to say nothing of our world today, we must return to the kinds of spatial projections, geographic imaginaries, and real world questions of power that Carmen Benito Vessels locates in the 16th century inter-imperial contest to name, claim, and colonize particular parts of the Americas. At least 17 maps produced between 1526 and 1570 plot Las Tierras de Ayón on the territories that we now think of as part of the ecosystem of the Chesapeake Bay, as well as fictional projections that linked Virginia and Maryland with Zacatecas and the South Sea. As late as 1650, English promotional agents like John Farrar and Edward Williams paint, printed maps in which the backside of Virginia led to commerce with Asia via the South Sea. English imperial projectors thought that the Virginia colony would become, if not a land of milk and honey, then certainly one with a vibrant culture of wine and a lucrative silk industry. Because Virginia was found on the same latitude as China, Virginian silkworks would equal or exceed what Williams called the more opulent provinces of the East to their wealth, reputation, and greatness, parentheses, besides the most Christian of all improvements, the converting many thousands of the natives. These lines from Williams's Virginia, more especially the south part thereof, richly and truly valued, published in London in 1650, suggest how the same Ptolemaic logic that gave pride a place to latitude rather than longitude, as we see with Ayon, influenced later generations of projectors. Recall that we heard that Chicora and Nueva Andalusia were lands fit for peopling, porque en ella hay muchos árboles y plantas de las de España, according to the asiento that Vasquez de Ayon um, negotiated with the crown in 1525, as Carmen analyzes in her book. Williams's work also shows how these English projectors, by which I mean early modern writers who proposed elaborate and often untested ideas to reform government and commerce in domestic markets and overseas territories, called projectors in English and arbitristas in Spanish, shifted the center of colonial possibility from Spanish Florida to English Virginia. Williams's Virginia, more especially the south part thereof, was, as we see in Carmen's book, those portions of the Carolinas where Jesuit missionaries and Spanish imperial agents like Vasquez de Ayon brought with them slave traders, women to bear children, and a variety of artisan laborers, including masons, tailors, carpenters, and iron workers, to create the biological and physical foundations of a colony. And yet, as far as we know, there are no archeological remains to give testimony to this colonial project. Instead, we have maps that record the failures of permanent European settlement, such as that made by Diego Rivera in 1529, which relays how many of the early Spanish settlers of present day Georgia and the Carolinas died of hunger over the winter because they lacked basic mantenimientos or provisions. These moments remain understudied in colonial history because their brief presences tend to leave scant long-term evidence of the things that we often analyze, such as political, social, and economic relations between and among indigenous African and European communities, or the realities of life on the ground for these diverse populations as they changed over time. <coughs> we dismiss them as failed colonies, and we turn our attention to the imperial projects with more visible long-term consequences. As Carmen's work shows, this approach is misguided. And as I conclude today, I'd like to suggest how Carmen's book opens up new questions in three areas of colonial study. As I see it, España y la Costa Atlántica de los Estados Unidos <coughs> invites us to consider three major questions of failure, race, and collaboration from a new perspective. First, it suggests that we need to critically revise dominant notions of failure. This definition, of course, presupposes an imperial viewpoint in which a successful colony is one that takes root and leaves a lasting imprint upon the colonized. That alone is enough to give us pause. But it also means that we prioritize places and contexts in which 16th and 17th century events have lasting provable consequences in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. By starting with these later periods and mapping questions of power, inequality, and colonization back onto early colonial documents, we are doing history backwards. I'm not arguing that historical legacies of colonization are unimportant, rather that we prioritize particular histories because of their influences in later day eras. And in doing so, we miss important opportunities 
to analyze what Robert Blair St. George called the possible pasts of colonial life. We also miss opportunities to analyze what colonial subjects and imperial agents thought was possible at a particular moment in time. These possibilities tell us about the history of the idea of the new world, and they are in many ways as important to understand as are the histories of the new world itself. After all, Vasquez de Leon may not have left a trace upon the landscape, but his story and the story of his story inspired other European agents who viewed the 17 maps of his territory to try their hand at New World colonization. Recent work on imperial failures, one of the two framing devices of a volume on European empires in the American South, edited by Joseph P. Ward with an afterword by Kathleen Duval, published by the University of Mississippi Press in 2017, provides what Ward calls evidence of the power of the concept of empire to hold the imagination of all concerned, despite the many obvious challenges that would-be imperialists face when striving to bring their ambition to fruition. Indeed, this type of analysis suggests that the study of failed colonial enterprises can reveal critical insights into the many Souths, a wide variety of forms and experiences of slavery, and myriad and changing empires, nations, confederacies, and towns, as Duval writes in the closing pages. Second, as we think about these many Souths, Works like Carmen Benito Vessel's book invite us to reconsider our study of race, casta, and the marking of human difference in the early Americas. We know that there are major differences in the way that Anglophone colonists in North America and Hispanophone colonists and Lusophone colonists in South America categorized human beings, whose humanity they denied, by external factors like skin color, spoken language, clothing, and hair texture, as well as less, less observable features like religious professions, craft labor, and family lineage. We know also that ideas of a one-drop rule and the proliferation and contraction of casta categories shift by region and over time. So what would it look like to study early English reports on indigenous communities of Algonquin, Susquehannas, and Cherokees through the lens of Native American contact with Iberian empires? Recent research by scholars like Alejandro Dukovsky begins to ask these important questions and to do so with methods that center indigenous historical actors. But more work is needed. For example, we know little of how the Spanish colonization of the Mid-Atlantic might have shaped indigenous communities' ideas about race and how those expectations may have influenced their interactions with black Africans, from Estebanico to the 20-odd women and men who landed in Hampton Roads, Virginia in 1619, marking the first permanent community of enslaved Africans in British North America. Cassandra L. Smith asks some of these questions in her research, and Cassie would be among the first to tell us that we need to know more about the complex interaction of indigenous African and European populations in sites with layered colonial histories. Third, and finally, Carmen's study of indigenous collaborators like Don Luis and Francisco <coughs> Chicorano ask that we reconsider the nat nature of collaboration itself. As my colleague Anna Brickhouse shows in The Unsettlement of America, and as Carmen points out in her analysis of Brickhouse's work, indigenous agents were central to the movement of European empires shaping, sharing, and withholding information to shape the path of colonization and to protect <coughs> the people where they could. New studies of indigenous translators and messengers, such as Cécile Carillon's work on gestures in the French Atlantic, offers to extend our analysis of indigenous agencies into performative and non-lettered realms. Doing so also asks that we consider what it means to inform and to collaborate. We used to study hybridity and mestizaje, as powerful acts of transculturation and cultural accommodation. But now we see, as art historian Ananda Coenaponte argues, that hybridity cannot happen without the kind of violence in which one side imposes its will and way of being in the world upon another. In a similar way, as we begin to center histories of Spanish America, including spaces like the Mid-Atlantic and present-day De Soto County, Mississippi, and to center indigenous actors within those histories, we will need to more carefully and more critically analyze the nature of colonial collaboration. Professor Benito Vessels is right to detail the importance of la, co co la colaboración con el Indio Don Luis as part of a Spanish strategy against colonial French interests and to note how Don Luis sabotaged Spanish imperial efforts. So what then does it mean for indigenous actors to collaborate with colonial officials? How should we study acts of colonial collaborations within what Enrique Sandeter identifies as the overarching framework of coercion within which indigenous women and men made decisions about where and how to work. 
So as we think about new directions in the field of colonial studies, whether on failure, race, collaboration, or any of the other rich avenues of inquiry laid out in España y la Costa Atlántica de los Estados Unidos, we can all agree that Carmen Benito Vessels' book gives us an exciting new way to approach and to frame these questions and a rich set of multidisciplinary methodologies with which to analyze them. Congratulations, Carmen, on a wonderful book. I look forward to reading all of the studies and future projects that your work inspires. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. And if you're not blown away already by the possibilities of this book, uh, you know. Um, I, I, I know that your curiosity is now spiked, but I will actually urge you to go get a volume of, you know, get a copy. This one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to plug in from this book. Get your own copy. <laughs> don't, don't be satisfied. I know these presentations are absolutely marvelous. And they have placed this book in a, in a fantastic context, in, in, an, in you know, multi-imperial uh, context and also uh, have presented really, um, you know, the erasures that are there that are beyond this, the Hispanic population and goes to the indigenous and so on. But go get your own copy. And now <laughs> I am going to uh, call to the podium my esteemed colleague, uh, Carmen Benito Vessels, who will talk a little bit about her project as well, and maybe respond a bit to her two presenters. I want to announce that she is no longer a medievalist, no longer <laughs> a closet colonialist. She has just come out, and she's now a full colonialist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. series uh, gave us a forum for all the professors from the Spanish and Portuguese department at the University of Maryland to be able to discuss our work here at the Library of Congress. I don't need to explain where we are. It's really a humbling experience for me to be here today. And I, don't, I hope that my book, in a way, is a contribution to the legacy started by Thomas Jefferson. And I it can make my children proud of their, their mommy working day and night and, <laughs> and be a citizen of both countries. Also, I don't have enough words to uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Chan Rodriguez for her general support from the very beginning. I was a little bit hesitant, I have to admit, because yes, I was coming from the Middle Ages, not the dark Middle Ages, <laughs> the bright <laughs> Middle Ages, and uh, having uh, her accolades meant a lot to me. I knew that I had a story to tell, but I didn't know that my story had a place in the new modern times, in the colonial times. Thank you, thank you very much. And of course, uh, Professor Bigelow, she's, she has been the most generous person I have met in the last uh, few decades. <laughs> she uh, accepted to leave aside her work. We know about the deadline that she has. We know how important it is to meet deadlines and she put her book on one side of the table in order to read carefully uh, mine and discuss it with such eloquence. I think I'm going to read it myself after your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it was a, a very wonderful in, and insightful reading from both of you. Thank you so much. And of course, I cannot forget uh, the help of my former colleague, Talia Goodman, who has done impeccable work in order to make this event a possibility. We are here thanks to her, and she has, has, she has encountered a few glitches, we will say, <laughs> in order to uh, finally get, uh, give, um, put us all together. And of course, the former and present directors of the uh, uh, Hispanic division, Dr. Uh, Mer uh, Meredith, no, <laughs> no, Dr. Um, no, Georgette Dorn, and Dr. Susan Shaw. Thank you, thank you very much. Also, thank you to my family, friends, to uh, distinguished guests, my colleagues, of course, my students, thanks to you, I keep fighting every day and I keep reading to, to know a little bit more than what you already do. 
and thank you to all of you for being here today. As I say, it, it is a pleasure and, and an honor to be able to talk a little bit about a work that is very solitary. And whenever I have an audience, I try to please the audience. Let's see if I achieve my goal today. And uh, since I cannot speak with in, a, in an impartial manner about my work, I, we, I thought that I could tell you a few just uh, items about how I became an author of this book. And uh, it, it only started with a class, a class uh, for a summer session. That is an intense <coughs> summer session, five days a week, four hours daily. Uh, you have to be really, really, really uh, you have to have good material in, or, in order to captivate your students and in order to keep your sanity. <laughs> so I uh, started by uh, calling this class Spanish Treasures in the, uh, in the Washington DC area, trying to link the past of the, oh, I didn't have any idea where I was going, but trying to, <laughs> to link what I saw at the National Gallery of Art. And uh, of course we have enormous treasures there. It's easy to connect Velázquez, Durbarán, uh, Murillo, Goya, El Greco, and all these painters with traditional uh, literary works. And I have done that several times, so I decided to go a step further and come to the Library of Congress. And this is where I came face to face with Lucas Vázquez de Ayón, who was in the entourage of Pedro Menéndez de Avilés. I knew a little bit about Pedro Menéndez de Avilés. I don't think I have heard the name of Ayón, or at least I didn't register it in my mind. And uh, I came also face to face and became good friends with the two Native American Indians that I in my, uh, that I deal with in my book, Chicorano, Francisco Chicorano and Don Luis de Velasco. So I started digging and reading and reading more and more. And uh, in order to reassure myself, whenever I, I, I run into a colonialist uh, or a professor of uh, English history, um, I try to put just a little question to test the waters and to see <laughs> why they knew. And uh, well, um, not much in the beginning, and I kept talking, and usually the uh, answer I received was, really? No kidding. <laughs> 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 Where did you get that? That if the Spaniards were here in Virginia? No way. No way. <laughs> I said, well, you know, uh, I think that these characters are looking for an author. I volunteer. Mm -hmm. uh, I volunteer, and, and I will be the author for uh, this uh, uh, and, and, see, and see where we go together. So um, we also know about the uh, imaginary line of the Treaty of Tordesillas, 1949, uh, which is marvelous. It's the, uh, the wisest decision ever to divide the war in between two countries, Spain and Portugal. I mean, can anybody have a doubt that this is a logical thing to do? <laughs> no. OK, so we knew about the, uh, this line, but as well, if the Spaniards were here, there may be other lines that we don't know about. Sure enough, I, I found a book that was called Spanish Borderlands, and uh, written by Eugene Bolton. Uh, coincidence, coincidence, I live, we live, my husband and I live in Bolton Walk when we were in California. I didn't have any idea who this <laughs> Bolton will come back to me in my life, but anyway. <laughs> so um, the, the other imaginary lines for the Spanish Borderlands <laughs> were a little bit blurry. And uh, we, as uh, Professor Chan Rodriguez mentioned, La Florida, uh, the colonial La Florida, the limits were much <coughs> like, more extraordinary than anything that we can imagine. Some of them, like Escobedo, will just not be uh, shy and will put the limits between uh, Siesta Key and uh, the um, uh, Labrador Peninsula. I mean, <laughs> why? that's in my book. Uh, you can see the picture. Uh, so uh, so why, why, why are we going to be shy? You know, yeah, let's go all the way there. I'm not, I, I'm not saying that he was right claiming that territoriality. But what is extremely important to all of us is to know that he knew about these territories, that he had seen maps or he has seen documentation in order to speak about these territories and in order to claim them. So every, uh, you, know, you can claim whatever you want to. Uh, that's okay, you know. <laughs> the, uh, what is important is to uh, realize what sources were he was using. Uh, we also find, uh, so the borderlines were a little blurry, as I say, for the Spanish borderlands. 
But then again, that's nothing new. Uh, Professor Bigelow spoke about Virginia having a direct connection to, the chi to China, and I, I'll show you the slides let, later on, because it's true. You have that, that direct, <laughs> connection, direct connection to, to China. And you know, we all know that uh, California was an island. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the way it was described in Garci Rodriguez de Montalvo, uh, Amadis de Gaula. It, it was not only an island, but it had a queen, la reina califa. So, uh, yeah, so, so we, we, do, we do have uh, maps and we, we do have uh, um, literary works and historical works that can help us to document what we call um, cartographia and prosa, prose cartography. Thanks to that prose cartography, the letter of Américo Vespucci, who, as uh, Professor San Rodriguez said, was working for the Spanish crown, uh, he described it so well that uh, Martin Van Sebuller was able to do the ad map, uh, de uh, uh, depicting every little corner of what uh, Américo Vespucci thought he was America. So um, what um, it's also very, uh, I, I thought it was very puzzling, and I go back to Dr. Bigelow's comment on the Native Americans and the question of language. Language fascinates me. I think that is one of the, is, is probably the, the most powerful tool that we have. As I said in another book, is the only thing that connects uh, human beings and makes human beings uh, at, puts at the same level as God. We can create with words the same way that God created the world with, with words. So don't take, this, uh, don't take offense, but this is a, a common link that also is worth exploring. And uh, these Native American Indians uh, um, not only spoke Spanish, probably the very first speakers of Spanish in this land, and we don't study them. And uh, to make things even worse, they told the stories an oral narrative. An oral narrative, as we know, doesn't have an author. It has a myriad of authors, and only one, and we end up knowing one version. This is exactly the same thing that we have with oral epic, with the, uh, Spani all the Spanish epic, all the oral history of Northern Africa. Uh, I will, a commercial, I will speak about this tomorrow at the conference <laughs> in this, uh, of the Segundo Congress. So, uh, I, I thought that this was kind of a, uh, an issue that needed serious attention. And uh, I found myself that I had so much material and so many uh, avenues to explore that I was a little bit puzzled. And that was one of the hardest uh, moments uh, for me to real how to put this together, how to make it readable without making it just a series of lists which I use often in the book simply because I said, you know, I have to document what I'm saying. So I, I just use a lot of uh, bullets, say this, 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 and uh, in order to advance the narrative and to let the reader choose, I, I, want, I want to see exactly every year, every comma, every period that she is mentioning, fine. If you don't want to do that, you can escape, escape that and keep going with the, with the narrative. But anyway, um, I, I think that uh, this book is just the tip of the iceberg at least for me. I have many, 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 <coughs> uh, and I do, I, I, I mentioned that at the end of the book, many other options. And uh, um, I, one thing that I, I, I consider one of the achievements of, uh, or one of the things that I'm, more, I'm most proud of is uh, this book, I believe, is very difficult to catalog. Many definitions, <laughs> many definitions will fit but none of them will be exclusively. <coughs> and uh, I, this is uh, also a corroboration that children, I mean, their books have a life of their own, just like children. You have a child, but then the child does whatever what he wants to do. And, <laughs> and, 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 the, and he brings you wherever he wants to bring you. And the book does, uh, in a way, some, uh, has a, a path of its own. And uh, you have to let it go a little, come back a little, go a little, come back a little, until you find common grounds and you become friends with your own book or with your own children. <laughs> so so the, that, uh, the, the, that ability of, of, of making it readable was a, a, a real challenge. And as I said, if, uh, 
Uh, the other two things that I would like to mention about the book, and I'm very proud of, is that I didn't put a conclusion. It doesn't have a final, uh, a final sentence. It's an open ending. And it's not that I, I forgot, no. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't forget. I knew I had to put a, a, an end one day uh, to keep my sanity too, but anyway, I didn't forget. Uh, I didn't want to put an end because the story goes on. The story goes on and we have much more to research. And I wanted to have the last sentences as a sentence to speak with the reader. And it's a direct, uh, it's a conversation that we, the, the reader and uh, the scholars, students, right there, all of you, uh, uh, have to continue, uh, well, or I hope that they continue uh, one day. Uh, I think that um, many um, items can surprise us in, uh, in the, the story of these characters. And uh, another one to go back to the, uh, the Native American Indians is that uh, we have with Chicorano and with Don Luis de Velasco the first two persons who partially achieved their goal of defeating colonialism. So when we are talking about national history, well, are they not national enough? What do we have to prove in which nation? And by the way, it's a, we use gross, very general, generic terms, the Indian nation, Mundial. <laughs> I, I don't even want to enter that territory, the Indian nations. Uh, I think that I'm going to ask for a scholarship in order to um, be able to dominate this field a little bit because uh, the uh, uh, question of nationality and uh, defending uh, your own land, does it mean that you are not national if you belong to a different race mm -hmm. or you are still national? Anyway, and uh, of course there are many other uh, points in the book that uh, I would have loved to pursue because they are really funny. But I didn't do it because I would lose track, and that's why I have my pages, so I don't lose track. <laughs> but uh, uh, they're, uh, they, they are the perfect uh, explanation of how histories are always a mix of at least, of our, at least three kind of narratives, fingida, uh, ficción, y verdadera, which is uh, fictitious, uh, uh, aficionate, and true history. All the histories have that, and the fictitious and uh, and this uh, combination of three, I think that is marvel marvelously represented in, uh, for instance, the wife, uh, the, Astur uh, the Spanish wife of Pedro Menéndez de Avilés, Doña María de Solís. Uh, the uh, Pedro Menéndez de Avilés family wanted that wanted to keep that guy close to home. Apparently, he was not a very peaceful person and they decided to marry him or to make an engagement early in his teenage years. He was not very successful. But anyway, he uh, ended up marrying this Maria de Solis, and this Doña Maria de Solis was informed by Pedro Menéndez de Aviles that they were going to cross the Atlantic and they were going to settle in La Florida. So Doña Maria de Solis puts to shame any character from Garcia Marquez. Mama Grande or anybody else, <laughs> they are put to shame. They, are, they, they don't get even close to this uh, Solis. Uh, she decided, OK, if I'm going to cross the Atlantic, I'm going to bring my bed, my bed spread, my furniture, my silverware, uh, enough uh, plates for uh, 18 people, chairs, um, uh, enough uh, products to cook cocido, Spanish cocido, <laughs> nails to build my future house. She was determined to sell here. <laughs> And that's another point. If she was going to settle, she, uh, that's another very interesting uh, difference between when we speak in history about the English or the uh, French and the Spaniards or the Portuguese. Uh, we are conquistadores, they are settlers. I think that this lady was quite a settler. <laughs> 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 I mean, she had, she had everything that uh, one may uh, need in her future, uh, in, in her future home. And, uh, we, uh, we have mentioned before uh, the uh, uh, Americo Vespucci's uh, letter and how that letter, by the way, there is a copy in this uh, library, in, in the basement of this library. And, this, and here in the basement of this library, you have the richest collection of maps in the world. Four million is the last number uh, that five. I... Four, uh, five, five, no, <laughs> oh, thank you. I knew that my book was old. <laughs> five million wow. maps. So you don't have anything else to do 
<laughs> Get yourself a library card. And among those five million, there are five treasures uh, that belong to the early American uh, history. And one of them uh, was shown by Professor Chan Rodriguez by Diego uh, Rivero de 1529. And, uh, and there are other, uh, others by Ptolomeo and other Portulanos. But wonderful, 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 uh, wonderful maps. And they are all uh, right here. Anyway, I'm, I'm losing my track. I was talking about Americo Vespucci and how the, the importance of uh, secrecy in the Casa de Contratación <coughs> and the failure to uh, keep those secrets and how they were uh, sold, stolen, or uh, simply uh, spoken about in a bar. Who knows? Anyway, I'm going to conclude because I want to present just some images to prove that what we were telling you is true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is just I want a, a couple of things. Um, uh, I, I also expect that when uh, my book is read, uh, it is, I point out, I, I say that several times in the book, but I hope it, is, it registers in the reader's mind, because sometimes we only read what we want to read and know what is written. And uh, what is written in the book is that I do not point uh, my finger to any body or any country. And I do, I, the only thing I do is point out facts, and there's plenty of them, believe me. Also, I do not claim any national territory. I'm beyond that. I, I claim to the knowledge of territoriality and the maps that prove that territoriality. Also, I, I hope that this book is a, is a thank you note to the US uh, universities. I would not have been able to write, to write this book or any of my books if I have not been under the auspices of American universities. And uh, finally, it's a um, belated, uh, or late, very late uh, thank you note also for my uh, late parents who bought me my first book, the book that I own and treasure. I still have it in my library. It was a book, A History of Spain. It was, it, it, oh, it was much better than that. It was called Soy Español. What's there, I, uh, I forgot, but what I didn't forget was the beautiful uh, form of that book, the beautiful form in which the stories were told. They were all fantastic. And uh, I love that. I like it so much that in the cover of the book, I wrote my name and four family names, not two. <laughs> four family names and my age. So I look like an author. Finally, I have my own book. <laughs> and only two last names. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, before we conclude and uh, have time for questions, I would like to show you just a couple of images. This is, we, we know very well this map. This is the Juan de la Cosa map by 1500. Uh, in it, we have the, um, Uh, so this is a very famous map, and uh, we all know about it. And it was uh, uh, it was drawn after uh, Cabot, uh, Cabot's uh, voyages in the Atlantic. Cabot was working first in Spain and then in England, and we will go to that later. And this is the planisferio, the Alberto Cantino, 1502, is the line of tordesillas divided clearly the world. It's easy. <laughs> And we have the America Vespucci with America, you know, the way it was described by uh, America Vespucci in his letter to the King of Spain and Portugal. We have uh, in, in the book, you can find uh, an engraving showing this fact of the King of uh, Vespucci yeah, giving the letter. And this is uh, the quality is the best I could, uh, I, I, we can have. It is a very uh, faded map and this is right. Uh, Juan Vespucio, I call him that way because he was signing that name. He was the nephew of Américo Vespucci, or Américo Vespucio. And in this, uh, I think that if anybody has a doubt where the Spanish flag is and the imperial flag of uh, Charles I is right there in the middle of the country. And uh, these are, of course, also uh, the Spanish uh, Espana, uh, a Castilla and Leon flag. 
you have a, a little bit of a, a modernization of the map, and uh, you see all the important things that not only the names of the rivers, but also the caves, other accidents, and towns are all in Spanish. Uh, this is a, the entire planning sphere by Diego Rivero, 1527. We'll see a detail uh, later on. Take us two planning spheres, one in 1527, one 1529. There's a lot of discussion about these two, but um, they are almost <coughs> identical. And what is interesting is this detail. Here we have the Tierra de Ayon, Tierra de Mar, Tierra de Gomez, Tierra de Corte Real, and again, all the rivers and toponyms are in Spanish. And uh, here, is, this is a this very library in the York uh, Department. Again, the Sierra de Ion. And uh, we will uh, see in the next uh, map, the Tierra de Garay was the governor of um, Garay, Jamaica. Jamaica. Okay, this, uh, these are the voyages of Ayon according to uh, Hoffman, Paul Hoffman. Uh, in his book, he provides us with a, a name that the Spaniards gave the, um, to these um, uh, caves or, or um, by base, and the names that today they have. As you see, we go all the way to Ocean City, Cabo de Arenas. So they were here. Uh, and uh, this is uh, another very interesting thing. This map is also in this library, the uh, Diego Gutierrez, 1562. And what is interesting is that Bahia de Santa Maria is uh, pretty much located in the um, Roanoke Sound area. And which is even more interesting is that the English founded the Roanoke colony in Roanoke, of course, thinking that they were going to Bahia de Santa Maria. This uh, uh, Silverter Rally was guided by a Portuguese uh, pilot, um, um, uh, Fernandes, uh, Jean, uh, Jean Fernandes. Yet this pilot was not interested in helping Silverter Walter Rally. He was interested in making his own fortune. And they were fighting all the way, and this uh, Fernando said, I'm not, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll go to them. But he brought, this Fernandez probably knew about the other information uh, uh, provided by the maps of Ayon. And that's my theory. Somebody can refute it, but I have the maps. I have my theory. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, I, I'll be happy. I'll be happy to continue the conversation because I'm not a cartographer. And uh, <coughs> to uh, show you, uh, California was an island. It was an island all the way to the 1650. Wow. So. And there, I think they're trying to become a, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. And yeah, the last one. Virginia, with the ocean, go to China. going to China. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a perfect island. And uh, Florida also uh, is, uh, uh, excuse me, the Chicora. This is even more fascinating. Fascinating. This is the 1707 Chicora um, um, Peter Van der Aa map, uh, in which we have the information here in the corner uh, from the Peter Martyr of Angleria and the Chronicles, I think, uh, describing Chicora as paradise. And uh, to prove that his uh, idea was convincing, we have it in a map. Uh, this is the numerous uh, uh, forts and missions founded by the Spaniards in Florida all the way to Hatan, Virginia. And this, uh, I, that is not related to the new world, but it, I love this image. And, <laughs> and it's the idea of per personifying and making with a map whatever you want to make. And of course, the uh, disease Spania is on the head. Uh, well, it, it, it's Spania is on the head, but England is in the, it's in the bottom. Okay, uh, gracias. Okay. Gracias, Carmen. Thank you, Carmen. I, I, I hope you didn't spill all the beans. Now. I'm hoping to sell some books.
organization, and uh, we have this wonderful rare books in the back. So if some of you have not seen it and you want to quietly and not interfere with the camera, if you want to go and check it out, uh, please do. And we're just going to open this uh, to questions and, and to have a, a conversation uh, among the, the presenters. And uh, again, thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Okay. First one. Here. Yes. And the second, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you, to all the speakers, for a, a fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, my questions are about Virginia. I have two closely related. When the English came to Jamestown, were they aware that only a few miles away there had been a Spanish settlement? That's question number one. Question number two, I read in a Virginia historian, whose name I can't remember, that the Luis de Velasco may be identical with Ofa Kankanuf, mm -hmm. who was the uh, leader of the attacks on the Jamestown colony in 1622. Have you run across that? What do you think of it? OK, thank you very much for the question. Uh, question uh, number one was, uh, was were the uh, English aware of uh, the settlement. They were not only aware, they, ha they had the documents. Gomara, they, they had the chronicles, they had the books translated, they had the, uh, also um, versions in Latin with information. Cabot, as I said, uh, John Cabot and Sebastian Cabot had made their names in uh, working uh, under the Spanish crown, and they have gone to England. There is a period of 17 uh, or seven, seven months nobody can trace their history. And, that's, uh, and uh, they were both working for the Casa de Contratación. Therefore, I do not have a um, letter that can tell you, you see, here he was. But the information was available, widely available, is obvious. And not only obvious, but the cartographers themselves, the, uh, the foreigners themselves, stopped being hired in Spain because they were bragging about the, this uh, uh, secrets that were not secrets anymore. So uh, even though I cannot, yes, mm, I, I provide a document, I think that we have enough evidence to make us suspect that, yes, they knew exactly <coughs> where they were. And uh, uh, at one point, uh, we have a letter from a governor, governor, governor of Canso, who says to the Spanish king, don't you worry about uh, mentioning the word Hakan, El Hakan, because they, uh, as they know it in England, is Virginia. <laughs> so knowledge was there. And, uh, I, and not only of uh, the closeness of Jamestown and El Hakan, which are uh, kilometers away, uh, but also Roanoke and uh, San Miguel de Gualdape. They are also miles away, and they are both in the Roanoke area. So. Obviously, they, they have common sources. And uh, concerning your question number two, open, uh, I never can ever pronounce the name, open, uh, open Cancano. Open Cancano, yes. Uh, uh, Franci um, uh, Chicoran, uh, Francisco Chicorano, no, <laughs> Luis de Velasco. <laughs> Luis de Velasco had four names. Uh, one of them was Open Cancano, and uh -huh. uh, no, <laughs> an yes, another one was, um, uh, help me, Raquel. Um, Paquiquineo, Paquiquino, and, Paquiquino. and um, he, he had four names. Uh -huh. I have written them so many times that I forgot. But anyway, uh, he had four names. And he was not the only, the only one who had four names. We have other characters, such as Giovanni da Verrazzano, who, is, who was also a pirate, and whose name as a pirate was uh, Juan Florino or Juan Florentine. Nobody would identify the famous Giovanni da Verrazzano, we have Florino, Juan Florentine. But yes, uh, the, uh, there were four names, and yes, uh, the legend that uh, he was uh, um, in Virginia fighting against the English, and that he uh, really died from an, uh, an, uh, a wound uh, from a British uh, citizen. Um, and if you, do the, if you add the numbers, <laughs> he would have been over 100 years at the time. <laughs> but. <laughs> That's, that, that's, an, that's another, um, another line, another thread to continue in, 
an article or a footnote or something like that. Mm. Yeah. Hey, this is a question that Veronica, and then I, I want to ask a question I asked you. Um, Carmen, is there anything that uh, Raquel or Alison left out that you think it should have been brought up? No, I think that they um, they have pretty much touched e everything, and I'm surprised. Uh, as I say, I, I'm uh, very impressed with the readings and the idea that I uh, that I'm close to a, an invention of a time machine. <laughs> no, 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 no. This I, I it really was um, I say, um, a difficult task to uh, put all the threads together, studying literature and geography, um, uh, history. Uh, <coughs> paleography, translations, uh, international politics. I, it, it's, uh, I think that uh, they pretty much have touched everything and uh, I'm very uh, thankful for the careful reading, for the support and uh, for having brought uh, light that I didn't know I had <laughs> in my book and I really appreciate that. Our privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna ask it in Spanish, I feel a little bit more Uh, eh, cuando estuvo mientras estuve mientras estuve investigando para el libro sí, sí, sí. Eh, se dio cuenta eh, se habló de la interacción de entre los colonizadores y los colonizados o sea se hablaba de cómo se trataba o, sim o simplemente decían llegamos aquí y había esta gente oh no no there are numerous narratives I'm going to respond in English because I'm okay, I, can, I can do it no. I can no, do it in English so uh, In the writings that you found, uh, did you actually find how they interacted with the yeah, natives? Because yeah, yeah. um, yeah. I remember reading a uh, 1492, I think it is, by Charles C. Mann, and that, that explains that like a little bit of that point of view. Um, so, like, was it was the interaction same the same in the northern coast as it was as hilarious and destroying <coughs> and, and destroying as it was in the in the south in the south of North America? It's a very different uh, way of approaching colonization, and here you have to uh, back me up or, 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 or correct my answer. While uh, you go to the south, anything southern the uh, Mexico, uh, you, you can feel the Spanish presence. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a, a more, um, I would say, it was a, a more successful In, the ter in terms of transmitting the language and the culture. While in the North, it was, I guess, the, mm, I, I don't know if it's the number of uh, na uh, Indian nations that made it impossible, the multiplicity of languages, the uh, extension of the territory was a complete different way of um, approaching colonization. But yes, we do have the, uh, um, Ore, uh, Jerónimo, Fra Jerónimo de Ore, and all the other chronicles, Pedro, um, Pedro uh, Martyr d'Angleria and Gomara, and, uh, where they, uh, they describe how um, our catechism, even catechism, uh, uh, the, the Timucua catechism in the preface, is not about religion, it's about the cultivation of the land. So uh, you have to find data in places where you wouldn't look for data. I mean, nobody will look for uh, the way of planting a, a trigo or a corn in, the, in a catechism. Yeah. But you have to go there in order to, you have to be open-minded and say, I'm going to look for that, only in that kind of books. Okay. Yeah, so you, you do find it. I don't know if anybody wants to say some uh, last words. Uh, would you just <coughs> say something about the So I want I want to uh, you know give maybe the last word to any one of you if you want to say something. I wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart for you being here and accepting to, to present uh, this book. And I want to thank my colleagues and and uh, my uh, the students, the grad students who are here, and all the colleagues from other universities who are here and you guys who came from the library and from other places to, to attend this, uh, this uh, event. Um, we're very uh, thankful. I think we should finish before we get kicked out. But I, I have to make an, an, an announcement first. Uh, this is, uh, uh, as I mentioned briefly before, uh, we have a, a second congress of the North American um, Thank you. North American Academy of Spanish Language. 
uh, starting tomorrow and when, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. <laughs> and uh, today is the official launching, the inauguration of the Congress, thanks to our president, uh, uh, Luis Alberto Ambrogio, here present. We have been invited, and you are invited to um, to see the open, the, the first screening of a film called Un Amor de Borges, and then we will have a reception at the Argentina University at eight o'clock. The movie is at six thirty. The reception is at eight o'clock, and is in the uh, em Argentinian Embassy, which is in sixteen hundred New Hampshire Avenue. Uh, you can go by metro, um, the stop is DuPont Circle, and uh, members of the uh, Congress uh, can go by bus, the bus departs at 6 o'clock uh, from the Capitol Hotel, right here on the corner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.